Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending March 24th. First up, thank you for sending this in, Tom, Navy Thomas 8. Pasco Judge challenges constitutionality of red light cameras. Anybody out there like red light cameras? I don't think too many hands are going up right now. Evidently, they uh, picked the wrong guy to send a ticket to. Thomas Philippone said he doesn't think people should run red lights, and he argues that even the fact that he was caught on camera doesn't disprove the fact that he had entered the intersection already before the light started to change. But he's also challenging the con well, he challenged the constitutionality. And according to Pasco County Judge Ann Wansboro, she agreed that this was um, shifting the burden of proof um, to the car from just the car and the vehicle to proving the person was actually in the car. I know constitutionally you would think you would have to actually face your accuser and they would have to point to you and say, yes, I actually saw that person, or at least in the photograph say, I saw that person in the car, rather than just taking pictures of the back of a car and a license plate. Well, um, this is just an order that applies to this local area presently, but maybe if they can take this a little bit farther, maybe this can be proved uh, unconstitutional a little bit higher up. I know in our area, to kind of keep it going, what they tend to do is if you're caught with the red light camera, they make it a non-moving violation, so you're just happy to pay whatever the ticket is, I don't know, 150 bucks or whatever it happens to be, and uh, court costs and just not have it be on your record as a moving violation, and that way they expect there's very little chance somebody's going to actually challenge it in this area for the constitutionality, but this time uh, they stopped an attorney who evidently was able to argue his case. Uh, this is from the Tampa Bay Times, and as usual, down in the description will be the links to all of these articles. Next up, a piece of software, or an operating system, actually. I think a couple of people have actually recommended this to me, and I haven't had the chance to try it out myself. I'm more into the Ubuntu Linux, but this is called Zorin Linux. And the neat thing about it, there's a screenshot here. This is from lifehacker.com. There's a screenshot of it, and what it does is it attempts to make Linux look and operate, and they say it does it pretty effectively, at least the reviewer does, make it operate and look like Windows 7. It also has the ability, you can go in and change the settings and make it look like Windows XP, Vista, or even Mac OS X. As far as different operating systems, you can have it mimic any of those as far as the layout of the menus and the way it acts. They also said it has built-in Wine, which is Windows, a Windows emulator, although, yes, I know you Linux people, Wine does stand for Linux is not an emulator, but anyway, it uh, matches the API calls pretty much. I've had not really good success with Wine myself, but then the programs I've tried to run in Wine are not conventional run-of-the-mill programs. Uh, I guess it's set up and it works better when you have programs that a lot of people use, and then if you load them in and run them under Wine, it does tend to work. But if you're looking for a good Linux system that just basically has all the features and looks of the regular conventional programs you're used to or you have somebody that maybe has a hard time wanting to migrate over, give it a try with Zorin and see if they like it. This one next up from the BBC News. Uh, a lot of people aren't even aware of this, but actually there's a spacecraft that's been out doing a mission for quite a while. In fact, uh, for about the last nine months, the spacecraft called Dawn has been circling around the asteroid Vesta, which uh, a lot of the people in this article and the scientists say it's uh, something like a transitional, meaning it's almost big enough to be a round planet, and it is rather rounded and kind of spherical in shape, but not quite uh, big enough to have its own gravity pull it into a completely spherical shape. It's been circling around a while, and it's scheduled in August to actually leave out and start heading towards Ceres, which is actually a dwarf planet. It is actually large enough to pull itself into a spherical shape. So it'll be leaving in August and arrive there sometime in 2015. So this will coincide roughly when I come back. From, I do take a break usually in uh, June, July, and August, but I am coming back in August this year with the TDD reports. And uh, if there's some updates from this um, about Vesta, or about the Dawn spacecraft leaving Vesta and going towards the uh, dwarf planet of Ceres. I'm definitely going to include that in my stories if there's anything significant to do without it. But this is a very interesting article. They're talking about that uh, as the scientists talk about Vesta and they've been investigating it and the activity with the uh, asteroid itself, it's hard not to call it a planet, they say, because it has so many features and um, things about it that just remind you of a planet. Might be an argument to... Uh, change some of the definitions around again. I guess they've never really settled on uh, 
a true definition of a planet that everybody can seem to agree on. And I will also include the link below where you can go to the um, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory website. That's dawn.jpl.nasa.gov, but I'll put the link down below. And last up, if I can find it here, here it is on this link. Encyclopedia Britannica, local Chicago operation here, local Chicago business. They are going to stop making the dead tree version uh, as of, though well, they announced the actual last production run of the Encyclopedia Britannica was the 2010 edition, which if you want to try to carry it around with you, it weighs around 130 pounds, and if you want to purchase it, it's about 1400 bucks. They still have a few thousand copies left of it, so if you are interested, contact Encyclopedia Britannica. You can still get at least the 2010 version uh, if you have the space and the inclination and the money to do it. Uh, right now they're getting way more into online stuff and materials for studying for schools and things like that, but it's just kind of interesting that they did, uh, as of March 13, I guess was when the announcement was, about a week and a half ago, they did announce that there will be no more of these encyclopedias actually in printed version. It's not actually going to come to an end as far as all encyclopedias because, as far as I know, I believe the World Book Encyclopedia still is making a printed version and even current with it as far as I know. But that is kind of interesting that uh, something that a lot of us, I remember all the way through uh, grade school, high school, and college, that was pretty much one of my major resources, especially when you have to write essays or term papers with uh, citing a lot of different sources. The Encyclopedia Britannica was kind of invaluable spending a lot of times in the library, either at school or in college, whatever, using that for references to various articles. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.